Welcome to the future. You're listening to the Consensus Network. Consensus Network. Consensus Network. With Buck Joffrey. Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey with the Well Formula Podcast. This is the first uh, podcast that I'm doing since uh, the event in Dallas, Well Formula uh, event there. We called it Wealth 2.0. It was an enormous hit. I have to tell you, I was uh, just really, uh, really happy with it. And then it's, you know, the speakers were awesome. The bus tour was really cool because, well, shoot, we, you know, our investor group owned these buildings, right? And it was just a really neat opportunity for people to come out and, you know, really be able to see, you know, the stuff that they had been uh, invested in in over the last year so um you know that was super cool and then of course the biggest thing was just getting to know everybody um and i shouldn't say just getting to know because a lot of people were at the first one too and it's become sort of like a big party a reunion right i mean it's the you know lots of um information a lot of uh you know valuable information and the tour and stuff like that but also great reunion there are a lot of really smart people, and the community is just becoming better and better. So, uh, again, it was really fun. Thanks for those of you who came out. I know there was a number of you who wanted to come out who didn't, but we'll probably do this every six months is my guess, so hopefully you can make it to the next one. And I know some of you have also uh, suggested that we get information out on the next one as soon as possible. I hear you, and uh, we will do that. Now, um, I should also point out that if this is something, you know, this kind of group and these kinds of discussions are really valuable to you and you enjoy them, uh, we have an online community as well. And that online community is called Wealth Formula Network. And uh, Wealth Formula Network, um, you know, when you sign up for it, you know, basically you start with a course and that course has got a lot of the uh, you know, smart people that um, that we refer to all the time, you know, the likes of uh, Tom Wheelwright, for example, who spoke at our event, uh, Kenny McElroy, um, you know, folks like that to learn the basics from. And then probably the biggest thing is, you know, we have these biweekly phone calls on Zoom and we have this Facebook group and stuff. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's for people who like to geek out on this stuff, who necessarily don't really have a, you know, infrastructure around them in the real world that really allows them to talk about these things and really take things to the next level. If you're interested in that, go to wealthformularoadmap.com. Again, that's wealthformularoadmap.com and sign up. We'd love to have you. Okay, now uh, on for today's show. You know, I, uh, uh, you know, we've talked about this. We talked about a lot about this in the event as well. You know, I'm lucky. Uh, I'm in a peculiar financial position in that the IRS actually rewards me for my real estate investments by taxing me less. And if, on the other hand, I keep money in the bank or invest in traditional equities and stocks, which I have no desire to do so, well, the IRS shows me no mercy. Now, admittedly, this is by design. You see, I am a real estate professional. I qualify for that. And one of the great benefits to that designation by the IRS is that all of my passive losses flow through my personal tax returns. In other words, all that depreciation and mortgage interest that I get by investing in real estate not only builds my net worth, but saves me money in the form of tax mitigation. Not a bad deal, right? Think about that. If you don't understand it, listen to it again because it's a big deal. And then, and then on top of that, remember with bonus depreciation, even with limited partnerships, uh, limited partners will even end up getting K-1 losses, you know, somewhere maybe um, 40, 50, all the way up to 100% of invested capital. Now, those losses uh, add up in a big hurry if you're in a bunch of different real estate investments. So think about that. With that perspective, why would I ever consider investing in anything that is not tax advantaged? Um, you know, think about the returns, like the the types of of yields I would need to get in order to simply break even 
with the tax breaks that I'm getting from investing in real estate. I mean, that the returns would have to be huge. They would have to be huge. Um, so anyway, I'm not going to get that through Vanguard ETFs, for example. So I will, I will stick to real estate for the most uh, part. In fact, I truly believe that the only way that I could potentially get higher tax equivalent returns on capital is by investing in these things that we call asymmetric risk. Um, and for me, as you know, from listening to other shows, that typically is cryptocurrency. Now, you may think I'm crazy, uh, but I actually don't even consider, you know, Bitcoin. And I'm not talking about the alts, but Bitcoin, uh, all that risky. I know it's volatile, but I'm pretty darn sure that if you hold for the next five years, uh, that somewhere down the line, anyone who buys Bitcoin today and keeps it uh, is going to be pretty happy. Um, now I'm less sure about all the altcoins. In other words, anything other than Bitcoin, and some of them may have explosive returns. Hopefully, they do because I have some of those as well. And others may go flat out to zero. But Bitcoin going to zero, I don't think it's going to happen. I really don't. And if you ask anybody um, who is, you know, somewhere sort of knowledgeable in this space, they'd probably tell you the same thing. Now. When it comes to Bitcoin, I don't overdo it, though. I mean, for for one, it's important, you know, for me to have discipline. And, you know, as far as my own investing goes, value add real estate is really my bread and butter. And, of course, buying Bitcoin, as I just mentioned, does not save me money. It's not tax advantage. So what's a Bitcoin hodler to do? And what's a hodler, by the way? A hodler? Well, it's crypto for holder somebody who's not selling but just holding. Anyway, one thing you could do if you hold Bitcoin is remember the old slogan, buy, borrow, and die. That's the mantra of the ultra-wealthy. The idea is that you can borrow against most of the assets that you own uh, and invest uh, in something else, right? So when you borrow a, like a collateralized loan on something that you that you already own, uh, which is, you know, typically done with, say, stocks and bond portfolios. It can be done with real estate. It can be done with art, even gold, things like that. Uh, you can basically borrow against that, you know, create this liquidity. You're not taxed on that liquidity. Then you invest in something else. Now, if you invest in real estate, not only do you get the benefits of, you know, your invested capital, you know, going liquid and still staying in whatever appreciated asset, but you also get the tax advantages uh, for investing that borrowed money. So, um, you know, you can do this with all kinds of assets I've mentioned. And the traditionally have, have done this, as I mentioned, with more of the traditional assets. But the good news is uh, for folks like me, uh, you can now do that with things like Bitcoin as well. And uh, that's what this show's all about. Uh, about Bitcoin and that whole ecosystem and and the borrowing. Zach Prince, um, he is our guest today. He's the founder of a cutting edge company called BlockFi, which is essentially creating financial products from Bitcoin and other eco, uh, cryptocurrency ecosystems, including the origination of loans. Uh, um, you know, basically having Bitcoin collateralized uh, debt which is what I'm interested in, even savings accounts, so that if you have a Bitcoin and you just want more Bitcoin, you could just put it in somewhere and get whatever, you know, 6%, uh, whatever it is. Anyway, this uh, this week's Wealth Formula podcast, Zach's going to tell us all about it. Uh, he's going to also tell us a lot about the massive infrastructure that's creeping slowly but surely into the Bitcoin ecosystem. You know, I know that not everybody is into this stuff and, and, you know, they're like, okay, great. I'm not really interested in Bitcoin. But the reality is, listen, this is something that's a very good chance of just becoming part of your everyday, um, you know, your world. So you might as well learn about it, even if you're not interested in buying it. So with that being said, after these messages, we will be right back with Zach Prince. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today, my guest in Wealth Formula podcast is Zach Prince. He's founder and CEO of BlockFi. Now, BlockFi bridges the gap between blockchain and the basic financial products uh, that uh, you're used to, including interest-bearing accounts and loans. Zach, welcome to Wealth Formula podcast. I think you we might have had you on before uh, as a consensus network replay, but 
First time on Wealth Formula Podcast specifically. So welcome. Yeah, excited to be here, Buck. Thanks for having me, and it's good to chat with you again. Yeah, so uh, remind me how you got into this you know, Bitcoin stuff in the first place. I mean, you were, uh, you're, as I understand, you were a traditional finance guy, right? Um, so where did the blockchain part come in? <clears throat> sure. So I was, uh, I was working at a company in the fintech world that provided data and technology solutions to institutional investors that wanted to participate in some of the new online lending platforms, whether they were real estate platforms or consumer lending platforms. Um, and I kind of became the fintech guy amongst my friend group. And people would ask me, you know, should I invest in these uh, real estate deals on Fundrise or yeah. should I buy loans from Lending Club? And I started writing a blog uh, to, you know, share the information more efficiently with my friends, basically. Um, and I started expanding a little bit, writing about robo-advisory and some other things that were going on in the fintech space. And that's what led me to Bitcoin. And this is back in early 2015. Uh -huh. um, I didn't start BlockFi until 2017 because I started following the market in the background, still working in traditional uh, financial services and fintech. Um, and then in early 2017, it started to feel like mainstream adoption was starting to happen in the crypto ecosystem. Yeah. I started going to some meetups in New York City because at a certain point, my wife said, Zach, you're talking about crypto all the time and you're talking to me about it and I don't want to talk about it. So <laughs> Yeah. You, should, you should go find some, you know, other people to talk about this with. Um, and the meetup composition started to change. And in 2016, when I started going to these meetups, it was the early crypto adopters, you know, libertarians, uh, computer scientists. And then in early 2017, I started to see some venture capitalists, some uh, guys who had just left their job at Wall Street, still wearing a suit, uh, some more entrepreneurs. And it was a really exciting time in the ecosystem. Things like the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance were getting announced, which had participation mm -hmm. from Microsoft and uh, a lot of other, you know, Fortune 500 companies. And I had started to believe in it. I was drinking the Kool-Aid a little bit. And so I decided to find a way to get involved in the space full time. And that's what led me to start BlockFi. So I have to imagine that the response you got from the traditional finance people around that time when you started talking about the blockchain space and when you started being more and more involved with that um, was probably not a very positive response initially. Uh, or did you, did you experience some of that sort of, uh, you know, rejection initially <laughs> to what you were doing? Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, um, throughout my career, this is now kind of the third emerging technology industry that I've worked in. I was originally in advertising technology starting like, you know, 15 years ago. Yeah. And then I was in FinTech, specifically the online lending side of FinTech, which in its early days was called peer to peer lending and now in crypto. So, um, having to do a lot of education, explaining yeah. to people, you know, why something isn't crazy, uh, and it might work and here's why, and here's the value proposition and here's what it is. Um, I've gotten very used to that and comfortable with it. Um, but yeah, there were a lot of people who were like, oh, you know, I've heard Bitcoin's only used by uh, drug dealers and money launderers. Um, uh, I've heard that uh, I'm supposed to care about blockchain and not Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, at BlockFi, we were providing financial products into the market. So it's a heavily regulated business. Um, so we also had to communicate with regulators. We had to explain to state regulators, federal regulators, why what we were doing with Bitcoin and other crypto assets didn't necessarily need to be treated any differently um, than when you're doing these same types of things with assets that they're more familiar with. So when you were talking to people back in 2000, I don't know, I guess 2016, 17, and it's not a long time ago, it's only two years ago, but I have to imagine that the response or the, you know, the approach that people take to you um, when you speak to investors is very different. Has it become more mainstream in that regard for, you know, for, for big money investors? It's, it's absolutely become more mainstream. Uh, you know, the end of 2017, you know, Q3, Q4, yeah. when Bitcoin was going on that parabolic run up, it started to get covered everywhere. I mean, it was on CNBC every day. It was in Bloomberg, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. And if you were paying attention to 
uh, the financial industry and, and markets, you heard about Bitcoin at that time if you hadn't heard about it before. Um, so from a baseline of uh, awareness perspective, um, it got a lot better. And then in 2018, you had a number of positive developments for the sector, including one that I think is probably the most noteworthy, which is that uh, Bitcoin futures were listed on the CME. Right. Um, and from an institutional investor perspective, that's massive. You now have a well-regulated, well-known, uh, super trustworthy venue where you can get exposure to this asset class. You also had companies like Grayscale bringing products to the market, which are accessible to certain types of investors right. in their brokerage accounts. Um, and you started to see some adoption from companies like uh, fintech companies like Robinhood and Square making Bitcoin available on their platforms. Um, so the conversation has absolutely changed a lot. And it's become less about whether or not this is something that's going to continue to exist, um, whether or not it's something that was just a bubble and is going to die. And now it's more about okay, how is it going to get used? How big could it get? Uh, what are the interesting applications of it? And, and what could it potentially disrupt in the, in the traditional financial ecosystem? So, you know, we had obviously following this, you know, pop in 2017, um, you know, I, I actually, um, like you kind of really got into this um, early, 2000, uh, early in, in 2017. So the timing was pretty good, I guess, in that regard. Good or bad, depending how you look at it. But I was there before before the parabolic move. Um, and then we have, you know, then we followed this up with a crypto winter and, and, you know, who knows if we're done with it. Uh, I guess we certainly are much better off than we were, you know, you know, it's yeah. funny. It's funny, Zach. I don't know if you remember this, but I, I was about to use, we'll, we'll talk about BlockFi specifically in a minute, but I was about to use BlockFi for lending or for, for borrowing. Cause I like this idea of borrowing, you know, collateralized, you know, collateralized debt on assets and buying something else. So, so I was about to do it and then Bitcoin (laughs) fell off a cliff and I was like, literally, and I remember I was just emailing with somebody, uh, somebody over there and I was like, uh, sorry, dude, I guess I just sold it. I just sold all that Bitcoin I had. And you sent one email back to me and said capitulation. <laughs> but, but it, I, you know, and so now we're looking back at these, uh, we go down from 3,000 um, back up, you know, we've been sort of flirting around this 10,000. And it seems like uh, we're kind of, maybe that we're stuck there. Maybe we're kind of out of winter. Maybe we're in a holding pattern. But it seems like to me that since the two years, um, not only is the awareness increased, but the development of the ecosystem itself is so much further advanced than it was in 2017. Is this an unusual case where the technology and maybe even the infrastructure is actually outpacing the price? Um, you know, it, it's really hard to say. Uh, I would argue that in some ways it's typical um, in other industries that that showed a lot of promise where investors could you know participate maybe a little bit ahead of the adoption curve. You saw crazy price run ups uh, with the the tech bubble and you know ninety nine two thousand being the one that's kind of top of mind in recent memory. Um, and and then on the other side of things. Uh, are we behind where the price should be now? It's really hard to say because this is kind of like a a commodity type asset built on a payment network and and valuing that is uh, is challenging and there's not a perfect model for for doing it today. Um, It's not as easy as something that's uh, that's cash flow producing, Um, but I'm incredibly bullish. Uh, I'm on record as saying at the beginning of this year that um, Bitcoin has only had one year in its 10 year existence where, uh, it, it had a lower low than the year before. Mm-hmm. And we started this year, uh, around the low price for 2018. And I predicted that we would end the year at a higher price than where we started the year. Right. Pretty simple. Um, and now we're up, you know, around 300% from where we started the year. Right. And one of the things that happens in investing is uh, people frequently look at things on a, on a year-to-year performance basis. Um, and when people are looking at Bitcoin, even if all we do is stay around 10K from here, when they're looking at how Bitcoin performed rather to other, relative to other assets at the end of 2019, it's probably going to look fantastic. Right. Uh, 
And you also have an event coming up in, in the summer of next year called the Havening, where basically the supply that's produced by miners uh, is going to get cut in half. And so if you believe in the stock to flow type models of valuation for Bitcoin, that is usually a very big driver of price appreciation. Yeah. So, so I believe May of 2020, right? That's right. In May of 2020. Can you just talk a little bit about that, just so people know, because they have any, you, people hear about it. I've been talking about it, but I don't think that I've really explained it. <clears throat> yeah. And, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not a computer scientist, so <laughs> yeah. I, I can explain it in a, you know, in a very simple. No one else here is either. So <laughs> in a simplified way. So hopefully that's yeah, okay. But, that's what we need. Uh, basically the way that uh, new Bitcoin is created is through this process called mining. And it's analogous to mining gold, except instead of finding a place in the earth where gold exists and then getting your trucks and mining equipment and digging it out of the ground, the way Bitcoin is mined is using this computer program. And there is now specialized computer hardware that's built specifically and optimized for mining Bitcoin. And you have this network of machines around the world where the input is energy into the mining uh, hardware and the output is new Bitcoin. And those miners are what provides the power for the payment network of Bitcoin to run. Um, and when we say that there is this event called the happening, what that basically means is that the output that's built into the, to the Bitcoin uh, program that the miners are receiving as their payment for contributing energy to the network is going to get cut in half. So uh, the miners are going to have the same, you know, relative input, but the amount that they're receiving is going to get cut in half for that input. This should, if the demand side for Bitcoin remains equal, it should drive up the price. Um, yeah. And if you look historically, Bitcoin has had uh, three of these happening events uh, in its lifetime so far, I believe. Um, and around each happening, you you have seen you know, six months before or six months after uh, a pretty material uh, run up in price. Yeah. So, and, and it also goes along with that sort of uh, th that the entire, the idea that Bitcoin, unlike, you know, other assets, um, including gold is, is it's a deflationary asset um, ultimately. And, um, and that's one of the things that makes that happening really significant. Um, Apart from, and I have one more question before we get to BlockFi, which is apart from the happening, uh, you know, thing that's happening, uh, what is maybe the biggest development or upcoming, upcoming thing that's coming up that makes you the most bullish on the future of Bitcoin or blockchain uh, in general? Um, sure. So I think uh, I wouldn't actually point to any one specific thing. I would point to um, two broad trends. Uh, so one is um, institutional adoption and participation in the asset class. Uh, and the other is um, better ramps for retail participation into the asset class. Um, and just focusing here, you know, on the U S market, because it really is an international story, but just in the U S market in September, we should have uh, backed launching their futures platform backed is owned by ice, uh, the intercontinental exchange. And there's a big core difference between their futures and the current futures that are available on the CME in that futures on backed, uh, backs platform are going to be physically settled. So that means that, actual Bitcoin is going to be needed to facilitate the trading on BAX platform, which does not happen on CME's exchange. So that's, that should be a very positive catalyst in terms of demand for physical Bitcoin that could have an in impact on the price. Also on the institutional side, uh, this year, I believe earlier this year, the first pension fund made an investment into an asset management vehicle that was focused on investing in Bitcoin and uh, private equity opportunities in the Bitcoin and blockchain sector. Um, so that will be a trend. Uh, what was the pen which, which pension fund was it? It was in North Carolina. So I think it was like the North Carolina firefighters. Uh, and, and the group that raised the money from them was Morgan Creek Digital. Sure. Who's actually I'm an investor in, in BlockFi? Yeah, Anthony Pompliano, mm -hmm. Pomp on Twitter, uh, and Mark Yusko. Um, so, so that's on the institutional side, and then on the retail side, you've seen fintech companies uh, like Square and Robinhood offer 
Bitcoin trading to their users. Um, but soon you will also have companies like TD Ameritrade, E-Trade, uh, and others uh, offer Bitcoin to their users, sometimes via partnership, sometimes because they've built it directly. Um, you also at some point might see progress made in terms of an ETF getting approved uh, that would give retail investors in the U.S. market exposure to uh, Bitcoin in a, in a really easy uh, and familiar way. Um, all of those things are, are tremendously positive catalysts and, and the caliber of people working on them um, only continues to uh, increase. Talent is attracted into the sector very, very rapidly these days. In, you know, one one question that leads me to is that all of this is happening with Bitcoin for the most part. Is the is the altcoin or altcoins, uh, in your opinion, are they uh, is is that market coming back, or is that something that we're going to see probably select, you know, group of tokens projects emerge and then the rest will kind of just get left in the dust? What do you what do you think? I mean, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what I'm doing with my portfolio and then I'll provide a bit more color. So sure. my, my, you know, asset allocation in the, in the crypto side of my investing is, uh, I'm like 90% Bitcoin, uh, 5% Ethereum and 5% BNB, which is the Binance. Yeah, uh, right. Um, so I'm super bullish on Bitcoin. Uh, I think that, you know, there's a chance that Ether makes a comeback. Um, specifically, I think that a lot of the stable coins that have been launched have been built on Ethereum. Uh, if you're not familiar with stable coins, it's basically the concept of um, a dollar, but on a blockchain, uh, which could be really, really powerful because it creates the opportunity for uh, the delivery of US dollar denominated financial services at a global scale, not using the traditional banking rails. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then BNB, I mean, Binance is the biggest and most successful exchange. They have a history of uh, innovating, creating new products, going fast. Um, and so I'm taking a bit of a flyer with them, but I'm 90% Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that I'm not bullish on any of the other altcoins, uh, frankly. Um, I struggle to see, you know, the big upside. I have heard whispers in, in the community that there's kind of like a new wave of altcoins 3.0 mm -hmm. that might emerge that, you know, could see some, some good returns similar to what uh, some of the ICOs did in 2017. Um, but it's not an area of focus for me. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's my view. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about BlockFi. Um, remind us exactly what BlockFi is. Sure. So we're, we're a wealth management platform for crypto investors. Today, we have two products that we offer. Uh, one product is analogous to a savings account from a traditional bank uh, where you're able to earn interest on your holdings, um, except on BlockFi, the assets instead of being dollars are Bitcoin and Ether. Um, and we don't have FDIC insurance, so it's not exactly the same risk profile as, as a savings account at a bank. But conceptually, you're able to hold Bitcoin in an account with BlockFi and earn interest on it paid in Bitcoin every month. Um, that's one product that we have. The second product that we have, which you were alluding to earlier, offers our clients the ability to borrow dollars secured by the value of their cryptocurrency. Uh, and it's analogous to a securities back loan or a liquidity access line in the traditional world, except instead of securities, we're taking Bitcoin or other digital assets uh, as collateral and lending at rates as low as 4.5, lending USD at rates as low as 4.5% a year. I'm going to pick these apart a little bit, if you, if you don't mind. Uh, in terms of the savings account, um, first of all, is it just Bitcoin or is it Bitcoin, Ethereum or so we actually support three assets in the interest account currently, uh, Bitcoin, Ether, and GUSD, which is uh, the stable coin from Gemini. Got it. Got it. And uh, in, in terms of the account, talk about the, um, the uh, interest because it's, it's, it's not one flat interest rate, right? It's different depending on how much, um, you know, how much cryptocurrency actually is held. Correct. So there's a there's a tiered interest rate structure. Um, currently on Bitcoin for balances up to 10 Bitcoin, we offer a 6.2% annual yield. And for balances above 10 Bitcoin, it's a 2.2% annual yield. On Ether, 
for balances up to 200 ether. It's a 3.3% annual yield and balances above 200 ether is a 0.5% annual yield. And for GUSD, the stable coin, it's a 8.6% interest rate with uh, no tier. Um, so yeah, those are the different rates. Why did, um, I mean, was it just a matter of like a, a an issue with people dumping up, you know, thousand Bitcoin and, and trying to get six, you know, 6% of that? Was it just too hard to, um, you know, make, make that a long-term part of the business model or why, why did the higher levels end up uh, uh, changing to a lower rate? Sure. So uh, one, it's a function of market conditions and two, it's a function of supply and demand. So we launched the interest account in March of this year. Uh, we were just starting to come out of the bear market. Uh, and one of the things that happened as we switched from being in a bear market to being in a bull market is that futures switched from being in backwardation to contango, um, which basically means that our institutional borrowers, the groups that we lend to that enable us to pay the rate to depositors had less of a need. They had less demand to borrow and they were willing to pay lower rates to borrow crypto than they were uh, when we were building and planning to launch this product. The second thing that happened is we were, um, uh, surprised to the upside uh, in terms of the level of interest uh, that we received from uh, depositors uh, and, and especially depositors with very large sums of, of cryptocurrency. So to give you an example, you know, within a day or two of, of making the product available publicly, we had a number of groups that were depositing uh, 5, 10, 15, 20 million dollars worth of Bitcoin. Um, and so the supply demand uh, that, that we have to manage right. is the amount that we have on deposit relative to the size of this market that will borrow Bitcoin. Yeah, right, right. And the size of the market that will borrow Bitcoin is partially a function of market sentiments, partially a function of the number of trading venues and the liquidity profile, and it's partially a function of uh, you know, BlockFi's efforts in terms of sales and, and client development and relationship management. Um, so the, the supply side got a little bit ahead of the demand side. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We we're getting on deposit and how much there was available to borrow. So we made a few tweaks. We wanted to keep the 6%, uh, 6.2% rate on Bitcoin available to as many people as possible for as long as possible. So that's why we went with uh, the tiered structure where we made it available on balances up to 10 um, and, and reduced it for balances above that. Got it. And um, the interest on that, when you say 6.2%, that's six point, like it's, it's all denominated in Bitcoin. You're not paying uh, cash out, right? Correct. So to use round numbers to provide an easy example, if you start on January 1st with uh, 100 Bitcoin in an account, by the subsequent January 1st, you will have 106.2 Bitcoin in your account. Yeah, and that that's kind of uh, neat too, because then you're, you know, you're also getting potentially the upside of that. <clears throat> you know, um, I mean, there may six percent, but if you if you're really bullish on the market, you're be potentially looking at a lot more than six percent on your money. Um, how about in in terms of the this? Uh, is there like a um, you know, do you do it sort of a month to month or six month or, you know, year long contracts for these things? It's uh, it's, it's month to month. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, the rates are subject to change on, on a monthly basis. We provide um, notifications at least a week in advance uh, before the end of one month on what the rates will be for the subsequent month. Mm -hmm. um, and people are able to, you know, withdraw anytime uh, without penalty. Uh, we reserve up to seven days to process withdrawals, but uh, we've never taken more than one business day to process a withdrawal. So they're pretty, pretty quick, but um, not instant for security reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it's, it's pretty flexible. Yeah. Uh, how about the, lo the, the lending side? How does, how does that work? So now I've got, say I've got, um, you know, say I've got like 10 Bitcoin um, and, uh, so I would deposit that, I guess. And you guys, uh, I understand that maybe that, that goes into uh, like a Gemini, uh, account or something. Is that, is that still how it works? Correct. So, uh, we have a partnership with Gemini for custody. Uh, so when you log into a BlockFi account, you'll have a deposit address. When you send Bitcoin to that deposit address, uh, it actually goes directly into storage with 
Jim and I. Um, Jim and I was the first custodian in the crypto sector to um, receive insurance uh, against uh, cyber hacks uh, on their platform. They were also the first custodian to get to complete a SOC 2 compliance audit, and they have a really long track record of custodying billions of dollars worth of crypto without uh, ever having any issues. Um, so it goes directly to uh, Gemini, and then you're able to interact with BlockFi's platform to take any actions uh, that, that you might deem necessary. So you can view your interest payments, you can withdraw, you can deposit more, you can also take out a loan. So in terms of taking out a loan, if you have 10 Bitcoin, that's worth roughly uh, 100,000 US dollars at this point in time, you can borrow up to 50% of that value uh, in a US dollar loan, which can be funded via wire or stable coin. And then the structure of those loans is that you make interest only payments uh, on the amount that you borrowed throughout the duration and you can prepay uh, at any time without penalty. And what, what, what's the uh, typical, you said it was 4.6? The interest, uh, rate? We have interest rates as low as 4.5. Uh-huh. Um, interest rates on borrowing USD vary according to your initial loan to value ratio. So if you have $100,000 worth of Bitcoin, we actually have three loan to value ratio options. Uh, you could borrow at a 50% initial loan to value ratio, which would mean you're borrowing 50K. The interest rate on that would be 11.25. If you borrow 35% of the value, so 35K, the interest rate is 7.9. And if you borrow 25% of the value, the interest rate is 4.5% per year. Got it, got it. Um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, the technical, so, so you basically pay that on a month to month basis. And then in terms of contracts, is those also, are those also month to month loans or how, how does that work? Those are, uh, one year term loans, one year term. um, with the ability to, uh, renew without repaying the principal at, at the end of the term, uh, at current rates. And our rates for those loans have always come down so far. Um, so it's a one-year term loan. BlockFi is committed for a year at that rate. Your payments stay the same, uh, but you can prepay at any time without penalty. Right. When do you do? When would you do an actual sort of, I guess, a capital call? Like what loan to value? Because you can go up to say you're borrowing at, you know, you're borrowing at the lowest rate. You know, you're at four point five percent. You're borrowing. Uh, say you, you know, just for round numbers, 100 Bitcoin, you borrowed, uh, 20, you know, uh, or you'd said 10 Bitcoin, $100,000, but you only borrowed $25,000 at 4.5%. What if Bitcoin, you know, loses 50% of its value, then then what happens? You know, you wouldn't have a margin call uh, based on, on that example. Um, if your loan to value ratio hits 70%, uh, that's when we have a, a margin call. Um, and the way the margin call works is our, uh, clients have the option to either post more collateral, pay down the loan using USD or some of the collateral that's posted for the loan or take no action. If they take no action, uh, there's a 72 hour window where we'll wait to see if the price recovers. Um, if it does, then no action is, is required. If the price keeps going down further, uh, then we will initiate a partial collateral sale to rebalance that LTV to a healthy level at the end of that window. Got it. Um, so in terms of the clients that you see doing this kind of stuff, what do you, I mean, who are you seeing borrowing? Cause you don't have a cap. I mean, you can on, on the borrow side, I mean, uh, and, and the rates don't really change. Like if you're depositing a hundred Bitcoin, you're getting the same rate differences as somebody who's depositing 10 uh, for borrowing. Right. That's right. So who are the people who are putting, I mean, like, are these businesses that are putting, are using these loans? Who are the typical clients? Sure. So it's, um, it's a mix of retail and corporate. Uh, on the retail side, we actually uh, did a survey uh, recently uh, on use cases. Um, and the number one use case, uh, about a third of our borrowers uh, expressed is that they were using the funds that they borrowed, borrowed to start a business. Uh, which we were really excited about. So yeah. um, the other popular use cases were investing in real estate, uh, investing in other types of traditional assets like stocks and bonds, uh, home improvement, uh, large purchases, vacations were all um, use cases. Uh, paying down higher cost debt uh, was another use case. 
Um, and then on the corporate side, uh, the loans are used for operating capital. So we have some mining companies uh, that borrow from BlockFi, other types of companies who um, you know maybe have crypto denominated inventory like exchanges or crypto ATM businesses are frequent borrowers from BlockFi. And our loan sizes range from you know as low as five thousand dollars all the way up to uh, seven figures. Um, so it, it's a pretty uh, diverse group of of borrowers. So, so recently I saw you guys had a uh, new partnership with a company called Casa. What is Casa, and I guess how does that benefit both companies? Sure. So um, Casa is a leader in providing uh, self sovereign storage solutions for cryptocurrency owners. Uh So if you're someone that owns Bitcoin and to use a gold analogy, if you want to own gold, but you keep it in your vault in the bunker in your backyard, you want to have physical possession of it yourself. If you want to do that same type of custody with Bitcoin, Casa has a solution that makes that really easy. Mm -hmm. Um, So our partnership with Casa provides uh, mutual benefits to clients on either side. So uh, CASA clients are are able to receive some discounts in terms of accessing BlockFi products and vice versa. BlockFi clients are able to receive discounts in terms of accessing CASA products. Um, And over time, we'll build some things into the user experience, uh, specifically on CASA's platform, that will make it, you know, uh, a bit more seamless to interact with BlockFi products while you're on their platform. Um, in general, that partnership strategy is something that you'll see more of. We think there are in the ecosystem that are specializing in areas that BlockFi is not focused on and doing things where we can provide benefits to uh, clients on both sides is, uh, is, a, is a win-win for us, them, uh, and, our, and our clients. So. Last thing I want to ask you about, last time I spoke to you, you had talked about the idea of potentially Bitcoin back credit cards, meaning like, you know, getting Bitcoin back instead of miles or dollars back. Are you guys any closer to that? Cause I definitely want one of those cards. I'm so glad you brought it up. Um, we're definitely closer, uh, but we're not, uh, you're, you're not going to have the card until like Q3 of next year. Probably ah. it's getting worked on these things, these things, um, you know, for better or worse, they take a long time. Launching a, launching a credit program is, is no small feat, yeah. but we're working on it. We've identified uh, some of the key partners uh, that we'll be working with to, to bring that product to market. Um, it is going to happen. And uh, I share your sentiment. Like, I, I wish I had it now. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Seriously, that'd be great. Um, well, listen, I, it was great talking to you. Now, we're, uh, so it's blockfi.com and it's uh, spelled like block and then F I, right? Uh, That's right. and, and tell us, you know, tell us the process of, of doing this pretty simple. Can you, how long does it take to apply for these things and that kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, no, nothing takes any time really. So it's, uh, yeah. you, could, you could come in and start earning interest and get a loan from us all in, uh, under five minutes. Um, and we also have a, uh, a client service team that's super responsive in, in terms of communication, however you want to communicate with them over email, uh, over the phone, uh, over text message. So, um, you know, don't, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're also on Twitter. My Twitter handle is blockfi Zach Z A C and our company Twitter handle is at the real blockfi. Uh, so we're, we're very active on those platforms and, uh, happy to chat with you there as well. Zach Prince. Thank you very much for being on Wealth Formula Podcast today. Thanks for having me, Buck. Appreciate it. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Hopefully you enjoyed it. And uh, again, I think it's really neat uh, that uh, Zach is doing this in the Bitcoin space. And uh, check that out, BlockFi.com. By the way, some people asked me at the event recently about how to buy Bitcoin and all this stuff. And, you know, if you're interested, um, I still have this website called Consensus Network. And if you go to consensusnetwork.io, uh, we have some tutorials on there on how to buy Bitcoin. In fact, you can only open a Coinbase account. And if you do, you and I will both get $10 of Bitcoin for free. So check that out and do it. If you're going to buy Bitcoin, might as well get some free stuff and send it, you know, and and have me get some free stuff too. Um, and then one final thing I want to talk about again, uh, folks, uh, 
it, there was a number of people talking about how to get more and more involved with this community. And again, all I can say is Wealth Formula Network. Definitely check it out. Go to wealthformularoadmap.com. Um, you know, these conversations we have and this uh, closely knit community, I think, is really, really worth it. It's not a very expensive investment, but it is an investment indeed. Uh, pretty much anybody who's in that group will tell you it is, uh, you know, it's it's a lot of fun, especially if you went to this event recently and you really enjoyed it. Chances are you're going to really enjoy Wealth Formula Network as well. So go to WealthFormulaRoadmap.com and check that out. That's it for me this week on Wealth Formula Podcast. This is Buck Joffrey signing off.